something happened this last week that was um, fascinating to watch. I don't know if you guys saw it. I'm sure you did. If not, you've been living under a rock for the last week. But um, it's something that was heartbreaking in a sense uh, because it was a near tragedy. Uh, but it was fascinating. Um, on Monday Night Football last week, um, there was a Buffalo Bills football player, Damar Hamlin, um, that was in the middle of the game and uh, all of a sudden fell down and they had to do CPR on him. They rushed him to the hospital. There's a lot of unknowns, right? If you watch the game or if you watch the highlights, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was happening and what was going on. We were all kind of in this state of shock, like what did we just watch and what is actually happening? And you realize like quickly in those moments, like what we were watching is just a game and we're, we're talking about somebody's life at stake here. Um, but what was fascinating to watch was um, as, as this was taking place and going on um, in the middle of Monday Night Football, there was this response that almost instinctively rose up in people. You saw, if you, watched, if you were watching it on Monday Night Football, the players started to kneel in circles and they started to pray and intercede for their fellow teammate or competitor. You started to see celebrities across the world online posting things about praying and, and lifting up in Jesus' name, healing for this guy, guy named Damar Hamlin. Um, and even regular everyday people, we started to see people share things and comments. And it was almost this big wave of prayer that just kind of swept over our country and the world in the middle of this chaotic moment. Um, Canadian psychologist David Benner says this. He says that prayer is the soul's native language. Prayer is the soul's native language. We saw this play out over the last week, didn't we? Um, instinctively, prayer rose up and kind of swept across social media. And it was all that we talked about, uh, the sports reporters, that's all they talked about. We saw sports reporters, Dan Orlovsky, pray on, on live national television on ESPN. Just some incredible things that were taking place uh, as this is going on, this wave of prayer in a time of trouble. I don't know if you noticed this or not, um, but over this last week, there wasn't a lot of posts saying that God isn't real or that he's not working in the middle of all that chaos, was there? It didn't feel like there was a lot of that. It was mostly people just praying, even people that were saying, hey, I'm not even religious, but I'm going to pray that this guy becomes well and he's healed. Um, our English word for prayer, it comes from the Latin word precari, which is where we get our English word precarious. Precarious. It's in the moments of life when the precarious situations are difficult, unimaginable situations take place that we start to see really and honestly that, that prayer is the soul's native language. That it starts to rise up in the middle of the chaos. It's like, oh God, would you please come save me? One of my pastor friends in Tomball at Houston Northwest, Steve Besner, says this all the time. Anytime there's a tragedy, he says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's this prayer of, of saving, of like, God, could you just come and, and save us and, and, and rescue us in the middle of our pain? And although God hears our cries, and he hears our desperation, there is a relational aspect of prayer as well. That those that are in communal relationship with Jesus, everyday followers of Jesus, when we are in relationship, we know that we don't go to someone in relationship only when we are in trouble or in crisis mode. Um, it would not be a very fun relationship if you had a friend that only called you when they were in crisis mode, right? You've probably had a few of those friends before. It's, it can be burdensome. It can be wearisome at times. It's like anytime they call you, they don't call you to check in, right? They don't call you like, how's your family? It's like, hey, boom, 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 all this stuff's going on and I need your help. That's, that, that's not much of a relationship. A relationship is communal. It's, it's, it's not just uh, desperation. It's constant communication. And so today... We are starting this series called Hungry for God, and we are partnering with um, uh, hundreds of churches around the Houston area uh, with uh, what we are part, one of our partners called Houston Church Planting Network, HCPN. You'll hear me talk about it often. Uh, Lindsay and I were residents with HCPN for two years, um, and we, we love this organization. Our church supports this organization financially to help, part, to help plant more churches around Houston. Uh, and so here's, here's the thing that we are trying to say is that at, when we talk about this prayer series, Hungry for God, we're asking ourselves this question. What would it look like to see a revival break out across our city? And I, I'm including Houston, in, or Magnolia in the city of Houston, the greater Houston area. Uh, what, what, what would it look like to see a real move of God, to see a, a, a revival of salvations across our city? What would it look like to see churches full of unsafe people every Sunday coming and kneeling at the altar and saying yes to Jesus? What would that look like? 
to see the spiritually dead coming to life. Kingdom gospel work is what we're talking about here, where churches get hungry for a move of God, and we see God do in the now what we've seen him do in the past. We see God do now what we have seen him do in the past. Um, we think about things like the Moravian revival. I've, I've talked about that often. Um, the Great Awakening, the Jesus movement. Some of you in this room are probably fruit of the Jesus movement that swept across our country. Uh, in this, was it the 70s, the Jesus movement? The, the people just started to come to know Jesus this, in the middle of all the chaos that was happening in the world. We want to see God do in the now what he's done in the past when it comes to this great awakening of our people and see salvations coming into our churches. And so today we're starting with a message titled this, Sitting with the Father. Sitting with the Father. The first two weeks of this series are going to be on personal prayer. And we're going to challenge you and encourage you in your personal prayer life. Um, something that I need to be challenged even in my own self. So just know this, that as we're talking about prayer, I'm not coming to you as an expert on prayer, that I've got this figured out and I've got it so planned out and scheduled out in my life that you're just going to hear my life schedule and you're going to be like, wow, all this guy does is pray. That's what people think that pastors do all the time is just pray in our office for 24 hours a day. And so we're going to talk about how, to, how we, we, we're going to learn about prayer. And then at the end of, end of this month, um, January 30th, through the end of February, we're going to do 30 days of prayer and fasting as a church with other churches across Houston. So we're not just going to talk about prayer. We're going to practice prayer, and then we're going to do prayer and fasting, and we're going to join with hundreds of churches around Houston saying, God, would you come move in our city? Don't you think about the power of that? That the people of God, the kingdom of God, the church, the capital C church across our city is going to say, we want to see God move in our city. I, I just, I'm, t- I'm crazy enough to believe that God's going to hear our prayers. Are you? Are you crazy enough to believe that God's going to hear our prayers when we pray this, these kinds of prayers? Um, and our hope and prayer is this, is that this isn't just a 30 days of prayer and fasting, but it becomes a part of our DNA. That it becomes a part of our personal DNA, that we become people of prayer. And it becomes a part of our church DNA, that we become a, a church of prayer. Um, and, it's, and so that's, that's what we are sensing the Lord is moving us and leading us in. Um, and so before we jump in today, I want to share two resources with you that uh, a lot of the info that we're going to talk about today is coming from. Um, And so two books. uh, I know some of y'all might look at this and say, Derek, I don't read. That was me in high school. I didn't read anything, um, and my GPA showed it. Um, But I'm going to show you these two books because a lot of stuff that we're talking about is coming from these two books, and they're a great investment in your spiritual life. The first is this one. Um, It's called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. Um, it's a little bit thicker than the second one, but it's, it's not a difficult read, okay? So if you're, if you're ever taking notes, write these down, go to Amazon, purchase it, whatever you need to do. A Praying Life by Paul Miller. Uh, there's a beautiful thing called audiobooks now, too, that you can listen on your ride to work. Um, no excuses, right? Uh, Praying Life, Paul Miller. Um, the, the appendix where he talks about how to use prayer cards in your prayer life um, is worth the price of this book alone. But it's, it's way better than that. Um, a, few month, a few weeks ago, uh, I guess it was in the end of November, I was in Huntsville with a bunch of other pastors, and Paul Miller came into this session. He showed us some of his prayer cards from the mid-80s that he still keeps today, that he still has things that he's praying for his family members. You should think about that for a moment. Like, think about the, the longevity of somebody writing prayers down and saying, I'm praying for this until it's answered. Not to treat God as a genie, but there's a persistence that we see in prayer life like that. The second, the second book is Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Um, I would say this is probably my favorite book that I've read over the last year. Um, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Pastor Tyler Statton, um, he is the pastor of Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. Um, if you know who John Mark Comer is, if you've heard of the Bible Project, Tim Mackey, they're all a part of Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon. Um, but Tyler Statton leads that. This book is incredible on prayer. I encourage you to grab these two books. They're the small investment. They're going to make a big impact in your life. Okay, uh, enough of the sales job. Luke, Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11 is where we're going to be, uh, and then we'll jump around here a little bit. Luke chapter 11 is going to be on the screen, um, but as always, we encourage you to bring your physical Bible. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4, and this is what Jesus says. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. 
Some of you may hear that and you're like, well, that sounds different from what I memorized. You know, we typically memorize Matthew, the Lord's Prayer out of Matthew. This is Luke's gospel account of the Lord's Prayer. Um, last year, we spent quite a bit of time on this, right? The, the Lord's Prayer, the Sermon on the Mount, and Matthew chapter 6. Um, but honestly, I could think of no better place for us to start as a church to learn and to talk about prayer than the Lord's Prayer. It's going to be an anchor point for us in a way. Um, but the disciples here, they ask this interesting question uh, at, the end, at, at the beginning of this, this passage. And it said, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, what's interesting and what makes this interesting is that any good Jewish young man would know how to pray. They would know how to pray. They, this would might not be an abnormal part of life. From the, from the day that they are born, they are having things instilled in them. They're memorizing the first five books of the Bible by the time they're age 10 to 11. They have prayers that they, they memorize and they recite. Three times a day, they kneel towards the, towards the temple at Jerusalem, and they would say and recite these prayers. I mean, think about that for a moment. Like To, to think that these are the type of people, and they look at Jesus and say, teach us to pray. They already knew how to pray. But now they're looking at Jesus saying, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Um, there was an aspect of Jesus' prayer and maybe his prayer life, probably his prayer life, that was just different. And I don't know if you've ever heard somebody pray that's really good at praying and thought in the flesh, like, I want to pray like them. Like, when I, like for me, when I, I relate it to preaching, when I hear Tony Evans preach, I'm like, I want to preach like that. I can't and I never will, but that's what I want to sound like because it sounds cool. Like, and there's something about prayer. Like when you, when you meet somebody that really knows how to pray and they have the right cadence and the right cadence in their prayers, they have the right voice, they have the tone, they got the volume level and they bring it down. They bring it up and they bring it. And you're just like in the flesh, right? Like this is not spiritual. Fleshly, we say, I want to pray like that person. I wonder if the disciples looked at Jesus and saw the way that he was praying and thought, that's different. That's not just reciting a prayer not that those are bad things. Those can be good things. They can be beneficial for us. But there's something different about that prayer. I want to I pray like that. So as we dive in today, I want us to zero in on two things this morning as, as we think about, uh, think through prayer and being hungry for God. And the first is this, uh, is that prayer starts with all. Prayer starts with all. What's the, what's the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen in nature? What's the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen in nature? Um, husbands, that's a good chance to say, it's you, lady, right? <laughs> Set it up for you guys. Um, well, the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, for me, it's recent memory um, because we just went there, but the mountains in Colorado, and you guys are probably already tired of hearing me talk about the mountains in Colorado, but I, 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 it's such fresh on, fresh on my memory, and I'd never been before. Uh, and when you see it for the first time, it's hard to take it in. It's almost like, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm speechless, um, the pictures don't really do it justice, I'm, although I'm going to show you a picture. There's a picture up here, I believe. There it is. This is me and Lindsay kayaking in a mountain. This is a, in a, in a, not in a mountain, in a lake inside of a mountain, uh, Lake San Cristobal in Lake City, Colorado. Uh, beautiful. You're surrounded by these mountains, thousands and thousands of feet in elevation. Um, on this trip, we got up to 13,000 feet, which I don't know if you've ever been to 13,000 feet, but you don't breathe very well when you're at 13,000 feet. If you ever want to feel out of shape, go high in elevation, right? Um, but on this trip, uh, getting up that high, you don't really get that high without seeing some steep cliffs, right? You don't, you don't get up that high in, without seeing, man, there's some drop-offs beside us as we're driving down the road. Um, there's this, the definition of awe is a reverential feeling, uh, a respect mixed with fear and wonder. It's like this, this, this mixture, this, this cocktail of fear and wonder of like, uh, I, I'm afraid of that, but there's also like, wow, this is incredible. Now, I can tell you this for me, that a person that does not enjoy heights, uh, driving next to cliffs of hundreds of feet will strike fear in me very quickly. I don't like heights. I get nervous with heights. And so we thought no better way to do that than just go to, go to Colorado and drive on these mountains, right? There's a sense of fear. But pushing past the fear, you're able to see this beautiful sight, miles and miles of mountain range, no person in sight. And we stood up on, this, on these mountains and just look out in these mountain ranges. And it's a sense of awe and wonder that like, you're reminded of the creator of all this. It's just like, wow. Pastor and author Pete Gregg says this, no one stares at the northern lights thinking, man, I'm incredible. It's true. You recognize how small your life is when you're surrounded by such grandeur. And it's like, wow. 
the God that made all this is the God that I'm communicating with. The God that made this entire world, everything that we see in it, 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 it's it's the the, the all and the wonder that fills our hearts and fills our minds. King David writes in uh, Psalm chapter 8, he writes this in verses 3 and 4, and he says, When I look at your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? This is the beauty of God. It's the beauty of the gospel is that, that he's so grand, he's so big, he's so inconceivable, yet he is still so madly in love with us and he, he's mindful of us. I should take that in for a moment. All the creation of the world, the most beautiful things that you can imagine, created all of it, yet he's mindful of humanity, which means he's mindful of you. He's mindful of every little detail of your life. Even the ones that you feel like are insignificant, he's mindful of them. That's the beauty and the awe and the wonder of God, is that all of that, all the great, greatness, all the might, might, all the power, all the strength, all the wonder, yet he cares deeply about us. When you start with all, you start with the heart that God wants us to start with in prayer. Let's look back at Luke chapter 11. If you're still there, if not, it'll be on the screen. Verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. This word hallowed, it means to greatly revere, greatly honored, to treat as holy, uh, or to make holy. Um, It's interesting that Jesus' first instruction on prayer, when he says, his disciples say, Jesus, will you teach us to pray? And he says, yes. And he says, first instruction is to hallow God's name. Notice that it's not our request. It's not to bring him our desires. None of those things are the first things that Jesus says to bring to him in prayer. All those things, although those things are not bad. And what we are not discouraging you from in this series is to to not bring your request to the Lord. We're going to talk about that next week. But he says, when you pray, the first thing you need to do is you need to hallow God's name. You need to revere his name. You need to ascribe holiness to his name. There's this paradox that is playing out before our eyes in this text, if you'll notice it, um, is is these are people, to to think about the Hebrew culture, to call God Father was inconceivable. To call him father was something that you would not do. It'd be, it'd be, it'd, it'd be so disrespectful. It'd be out of the norm, out of the, out of the realm of possibility at that time. These are people that wouldn't even say the name of God. They wouldn't even write the name of God without being ceremonially clean. Yet Jesus says, I want you to call God father. This human aspect relationship, but yet he's God the father. These are people that wouldn't even, they would even leave out letters of God's name when they were writing it because of fear and reverence of God. Yet Jesus invites us to this intimate relationship with the Father. The other side of this paradox is that we are to hallow his name. So he says, once you call him Father, there's this intimacy. And he says, but then you are to hallow his name, meaning this, it reminds us of God's separateness. You think about all throughout the Old Testament, there is a separateness between God and man. Right? You see that the, the, the God's, uh, God's on the mountain like fire and smoke. Right, The people, are, people of God are down at the bottom of the mountain. He's like, don't even touch the mountain. The, you can't go inside the temple. You can't go inside the, the, the holy of holies. He's like, all this separation, right? He's holy. He's set apart. We are, we are unclean. He's clean. We're wrong. He's right. All the things that we know. There's no one like him. He's creator God, set apart. Do you feel the paradox? He's relational, he's close, but he's set apart. The second thing that hallowing accomplishes um, is a bit more surprising. Is that it not only brings glory to God, it not only brings honor to God, honor to God, which the Westminster Catechism, if you know that, says that what is the chief end of man is to glorify God forever. It's to honor and glorify God forever. That is the chief end of man. What are we called to do as a follower of Jesus? We're to honor God with everything that we do. But it doesn't just honor God. It doesn't just worship God when we have awe and wonder of him, of who he is. The second thing that it accomplishes is it does good for our heart too. It reminds us of the scandal of God's grace. That although, although that God is holy and set apart and we are so sinfully broken with all that truth, God invites us to deep relationship with him. 
Author Tyler Satin of Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools says that everything that flows from the rest of the Lord's Prayer is an overflow of hallowing God's name. Worshiping God's name. Bringing glory and honor to God's name. Here's a few things that I want us to wrestle with this morning. How many times do we come to God only as a problem solver? How many times do we only come to God as a problem solver? It's not that he doesn't want to treat our problems and to solve our problems, right? It's not that he, he, he doesn't care about our issues and our, our seasons of difficulty and precarious situations like we talked about earlier. It's not that he doesn't care, but how many times do we only go to God as a problem solver? I always relate it to our relationship with our spouses. If you're married in the room, you, you, you know that if you only went to your spouse when things were tough and difficult, it wouldn't be very much of a relationship, would it? Here's another question. How many times do we flippantly come to God, not remembering or reminding ourselves of who we are praying to? This is what hallowing does. This is what awe and wonder does, is when we come to God and we begin with worship, we begin with awe and wonder of who he is, it reminds us of who we're talking to. I, our friend Francois snuck in the back here just a moment ago, and he's, he said something at community groups a while ago, and he just, it was it was like this mind-blowing moment for me. He said, every time before I pray, I stop, and I just say simply, God, I'm talking to the creator of the universe. I'm talking to the, the one that created everything in this world, yet he wants to have a relationship with me. There's a beauty in that. When we hallow God's name, we praise God, and we, we calibrate our own hearts. Second thing is this, is that prayer is an invitation to stillness. Prayer is an invitation to stillness. Um, the New Year's uh, is always an interesting time. And Lindsay and I were talking about this on the way home from uh, a t some time away a little while ago. Is that at the end of the year, I don't know if your inbox is like this or if it's just mine and Lindsay's, but at the end of the year, every single year, our inbox is full of things that we need to be trying for the new year. There's this new sale, this new diet, this new product, like all the things, right? And it's like you need to create this new habit. And if you're not doing all these things, then you're a failure. It's like you get to the new year and you're like, I don't want to do anything. I just want to sit. You got to lose weight. You got to start a new habit. You got to buy, the, buy, this, buy this new product. The gyms are full right now. If you go to the gym, you're probably like, where are all these people coming from? None of y'all laugh, so none of y'all must go to the gym. <laughs> new habits are trying to be formed. All the things of this new year just progressing. Uh, and some people love it in the new year, right? Some people are like, they just eat it up. Um, some, for some others, it stresses you out. I happen to be one of the crazy people that love it. I love the new year. There's something about it. It's like I, I, I'm, I usually die off around like March. You know, that's kind of, I, I last a little while. It's kind of like with school. I'd, I'd get the new paper and I'd open up the notebook and I'm like, oh, I love that smell. And then you have to write your first paper and you're like, not anymore. <laughs> but whether you like it or not, we can all agree that it doesn't feel like any of us have any extra time in our schedules to add anything else. Do you feel that? I mean, it's like all the pressure. It's like, you got to do this and you got to make this happen. You got to change this. It's like, Oh, I don't know what to do. We live in such a frenzied society. And with that comes the reality is that we don't, myself included, we don't know how to be still. Lindsay, if you could keep the amening down for just a moment, um, that'd be great as I say through this. Uh, you can ask Lindsay, I don't like to be still. I actually hate it. Um, I like to move around. If, I, if I'm sitting for too long, I just find myself like agitated. I'm like, why, why am I mad? Because I'm sitting down. I've got to do something. It must be like a husband thing. Like there's always something to do in the garage or the shop or outside or like you've got to organize something and mess with something. Like, like that's just my personality. Uh, when we go away on a trip or a getaway, it takes me two or three days to even relax because I'm just like, you want to do something? You want to go somewhere? You go to a restaurant? What do you want to do? You know, we can plan that right now. Let's do it. That's my personality. Our mind's singing about all the tasks that I left behind at the office. I, I don't know. I don't like to be still. Yet there's this beauty of an invitation that we need to heed today. Psalm chapter 46. You know the verse. It's probably on a sign in your house somewhere. Verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted, exalted among the, the first part of that. Be still and know that I am God. 
know this, is that all prayer <clears throat> isn't still prayer. Like what we're not saying today is that to pray, that you need to sit down, be still, in a chair, fold your hands, and this is how you pray every single time. That's not what we're saying. Um, some of my best praying happens when I walk around because I don't like to sit, right? I'm just like walking around. I can focus better. Um, do you ever see me uh, on the phone? I'm typically walking around. I walk a few miles a day on the phone. That's just what I do. Um, but being still is not, uh, it's not just a posture of the body, but it's a posture of the heart and the mind. Although it can be a posture of the body that can be important. Being still is a posture of the heart and the mind. So, so why do we need to be still? Why not keep going at the current pace of life? What is the cause of most of our busyness? Is our busyness, is, is it not to control our own circumstances? Think, think a little bit deeper than surface level for a moment. Is it not to control our own circumstances? Is it not to, to play God in our own lives, to try to, to try to outline everything and to make everything happen in our own way so that we can, we can live a comfortable life and we don't have to worry about the stresses and the worries of the world? Like that, that, That's the role that we are playing many times. So when we, when we, when, when, when we hear this, this phrase, be still, and we, we still our minds and we still our hearts, what we do is we put a hold on our grip of life and we turn our future over to the Creator of the universe. For some in a room, that's going to be really hard to do, isn't it? To take that grip that you have on life that you try to control every little detail. And God just says this morning, let it go. Doesn't mean your responsibilities go away. Doesn't mean that you have to stop working and we're not telling you resign from your job and just see what happens. That's not what we're telling you. But the grip that you have on life, let it go. Be still. There's a, there's a defiance in being still before the Lord in a, worry, in, a, in a world that screams hurry, run, stress, and worry. There's a defiance in that, isn't it? That if, if the world's screaming hurry, run, fast, you got to make it happen, you got to make it happen now, and to sit still in the middle of that and say, the Lord's got this. When we sit defiantly to the world and humbly before the Lord, I believe that we're getting closer to the heart of God in prayer. So here's two things that are going to happen when we sit in, st in the stillness of God's presence. Two things. The first is this. This will not be on your screen. Um, but we remind ourselves that God is in control. When we still ourselves in the middle of the chaos, we remind ourselves that God is in control. Among all of the organizing and the planning and the struggle that we call productivity, uh, we can sometimes forget that life isn't just dependent upon our hard work. But there's a greater force at work, and that force has a name, and it's God, it's Yahweh. Some of us need to remind ourselves this morning that all the work that you're doing, yes, it's great. But many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. The second thing that we learn uh, whenever we spend time in stillness in the presence of the Lord is that we learn to hear the voice of the Lord. I think one of the greatest temptations, in my opinion, um, is to call prayer a situation uh, uh, where, all, where we do all the talking, but we do no listening. Everyone has this friend, so hopefully I'm not making fun of somebody too bad this morning. Um, but you know those friend that, that friend that, or that person in your life that you can never get a word in in the conversation? There's always a story. There's always a thing. Uh, some of y'all are looking around. Trying, who is it? You, know. you can never get a word in, right? It's like they do all the communicating. You get done with the conversation. You get done with the lunch. You get done with the coffee, and you're like, I don't think I said a word. You leave that, right? You leave that experience, and it's like, oh, I don't know about that. And I'm not saying God has disdain towards us. That's not what I'm saying. But if, if all we do is come to the Lord and all we do is we talk and we talk and we talk and we talk and we don't take time to be still in the presence of the Lord and hear the voice of the Lord and learn what the voice of the Lord is, that the creator of the world wants to communicate with us. And I want to give a disclaimer here. Um, the primary way that the Lord speaks is this. Did y'all hear me? The primary way that the Lord speaks is right here. Um, if all you do is you're listening for the voice of the Lord, but you're not spending time here, you're missing the mark. Missing 
smart. The word of God has to be our anchor. It has to be our guide. It has to be what we lean into and what we read, what we study. We chew it up. We eat it. This is the responsibility of a life of a believer so that we know and we study the word of God. Now, I know that there, there can be some disagreement over this, and the theological would have great friends that disagree with me on some of these subjects and issues, but I do believe that God still speaks today outside of his word. But here's the disclaimer, is that when God speaks, it will always confirm what's in the word, and it will never contradict the word. It will always confirm what's in the word and never contradict the word. And if somebody ever gives you a word, and if you ever feel like the Lord gives you a word, the first thing you should do is not go put it on Facebook. Is to go right here. Say, thank you for that word, but I'm going to see what the word of God says about this word. That's, that's, that's got to be our anchor. That's got to be our guiding light. Um, you know, in the church world, we get, we, get, we get wild and crazy sometimes, right? It's usually when, the God, when God speaks and he speaks through somebody else, it's usually confirming to what the Lord's already been speaking to you. Like if somebody was to come up to you after the service this morning and say, you know what? I feel like the Lord said you're called to go to China. But you haven't been sensing that from the Lord, right? Maybe they misheard. Maybe we go to the word of God. Maybe we spend time at the word. Maybe we spend time with the Lord in stillness and quietness. How can we be still before the Lord in a world of stress? Jesus himself gives us some examples where he would go away in a time of prayer to be still. Many times throughout the gospels, we hear phrases like Jesus withdrew to desolate places. Quietness, away from the crowds, away from the noise, just him and the father. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. If the Son of God, with the greatest mission in the history of the world, can make time to break away and to spend time in stillness before the Father, could we not do the same? I just want to let that tension sit there for a moment. Could we not do the same? Could we not make time? Here's the temptation, though, is that we're going to say things like, oh, I'm, I, man, you just don't understand how busy I am. I'm a busy man. Very important. I've got things to do. I've got to take care of stuff. I've got too much on my plate. I don't have time to be still. And I would just say this with all the passionately love I could give you and say we make time for what's a priority to us. We make time for what's a priority to us. Richard Foster has incredible author, um, Celebration of Discipline, really great book. Um, But he he says this in, in one of his books. He says, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things, noise, hurry, and crowds. If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. To be completely truthful this morning, that quote hurts me. Is it feels like Richard Foster's been watching a loop, looping video of my life over the last few years. I thrive, I thrive off of muchness and manyness. I, I want to do, I want to keep going like, this. let's go, let's do it, let's do stuff. So I don't say this as an expert. I say this as a broken human being that is trying to figure this out just like you. Knowing that I need to be still before the Lord way more than I am right now. So here's, Here's a question for us. Are we willing to be different? Are we willing to make some changes and investments in our spiritual life? Are we, are we willing to get hungry for the Lord, for a move of God in our city and in our church? It starts with all, and then we need to learn to be still. J. Ed, J. Edwin Orr said this, I promise in closing, this is the longest closing I've ever done. J. Edwin Orr says this, whenever God is ready to do something new with his people, he always sets them praying. We've been sensing for the last few months that God was leading us uh, and leading our church to become a praying church and a praying people. The last thing that we want as a church is to be successful in the world's eyes, but miss the mark on what God calls his church to be. Listen, I could care less about numbers. I, I pray that our church grows for s- s- sustainability, all the things, but numbers are not the thing. I want a church making an impact on the kingdom. I want a church that, that, that is able to push back the noise and sit in the stillness of the presence of God. So 
So this is going to be a big focus going forward for, for us because what we're saying is this, is we're done doing church relying on our own power. We must learn to live in the power of God and that's done through prayer. E.M. Bounds, um, was written primarily on prayer, said this, how we estimate and place prayer is how we estimate and place God. To give prayer a secondary place to make God secondary in life's affairs. Strong words this morning. Strong words. 